Um, right, so the next uh, topic is um, around the language cloud um, API and details here. Um, so for those of you who were in the, in the earlier session, um, so in terms of the language cloud API strategy, there we go. Um, as mentioned before in the, in the architecture section, so um, essentially the language cloud platform um, consists of multiple microservices that each have their own APIs and communicate with each other through the APIs. Um, but in terms of customer facing APIs, we, we are introducing this additional public API layer, um, which basically um, as a customer or integrator um, creates an abstraction layer between our internal APIs, which are uh, very fast evolving, etc. But um, the public API will be shielded from that so that you have a certain um, API with, with a certain level of um, stability. So um, that allows us to, um, to evolve the public API at a different cadence than the internal APIs. Um, not break certain contracts, um, but at the same time for integrators, it's a, it's a higher level, easier to use API. Uh, you don't need to necessarily know all the details of the backend services. Um, the conceptual model is, um, is simpl simplified. Um, and also um, you need to do simpler, fewer API calls. So the idea is that basically, um, if there is some kind of operation you want to perform where internally you would have to call like three different services, um, for the public API what we'll try to do is for, for the most common use cases basically bundle um, that functionality into one API call. So you only have to do one call rather than having to do four and consolidate the responses. Um, in terms of the, the API roadmap, we essentially have two main um, APIs that we're focusing on right now. Uh, the first one is um, what we're calling the uh, content integration API. Um, so that API is all around being able to pull content from data repositories, um, tracking that and delivering it, it back. Um, that's a, a quite mature API because it's backwards compatible with the existing managed translation API. So it's something that has been in production and used for uh, three or more years. It's um, the API on top of which all of our integrations um, that exist today are built on. Um, so these are available today. Um, so they will be continue to, to be supported and, and evolved. Um, and um, yeah, so those are really focused around um, content integration. Um, in addition to that, what we're working on is basically the Language Cloud Platform API. Um, this is a new Language Cloud API which essentially sits on top of the backend, um, which will give you many more, more granular capabilities. So it's not just focused on things like the project creation and tracking but it's focused in, you can essentially do um, things like um, configuring your own workflows, configuring translation memories, etc. So it, 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 it will have many more capabilities. Um, that one is currently still under active development. So the first iteration of that is planned to be launched in January 2020. Um, and we'll go into a bit more detail in terms of what, what that API contains. Um, for those that, that are not intimately familiar with translation management, um, just two slides on, um, on main concepts, um, because I'll be mentioning some of these things, so just that we're all on the same page. Um, so when we talk about projects, um, that's essentially a, a translation project. Um, so this is the translation of one of or more files into uh, multiple um, one or multiple so, uh, target languages. Um, and projects are created either manually by users or programmatically through the API. So when we talk about projects, that's what we, that we mean. Um, target files, so um, 
essentially um, you submit source files into the system um, and then we produce bilingual files um, which are basically specific to the language. So as an example, if you have 10 source files and you translate them into uh, five target languages, you end up essentially with, um, with 50 target files, right? 10 per language. Um, and workflows, essentially each file follows a specific workflow. Um, and the workflow can consist of human tasks, what we call human tasks. So that's things like translation, linguistic review, desktop publishing and automated tasks. So automated tasks are things like file format conversion, uh, applying translation memory, applying machine translation. So that's all handled in uh, automated tasks. Um, a few more concepts, um, project templates. Um, so when we talk about project templates, that's essentially, um, it allows you to define a framework in terms of uh, repeatable creation of, of projects. So a project template will hold information around source, target language, um, linguistic resources to use, so translation memory, uh, terminology databases, machine translation engines, uh, workflows, file type configurations, pricing models, etc. So that's all held in a, in a project template. Um, in if you're familiar with other products from SDL in TMS, this is called configurations. In world server, it's called project types, um, but essentially it's the same thing. So in language called the terminology is project templates. Um, file types, so when we talk about file types, um, what this essentially means is that um, we, we need to be able to take a document in its source format. So this could be office formats, uh, InDesign formats, XML formats, HTML, JSON, etc and convert it into a bilingual representation of it. Um, and so this is done using our file types. Um, one key thing that we're quite proud of is that with SDR we're one of the few that actually develops our own file types. Um, so it was quite key for us to not give that crucial functionality to a third party that we're then dependent on. So if there is an issue with file type conversion, we can fix it ourselves and are not dependent on someone else. Um, which obviously from, a, from an R&D perspective is a significant investment, um, but that we're happy to take because it, it gives us more stability and also allows us to serve you as a customer better because we know we can fix your issues when, when they happen, right? Um, but essentially those file types are, um, are basically the, the logic that converts um, a source format into the bilingual representation that we need and then back into the native format. So um, if you start with a word file, you get a bilingual representation of it, and then at the end you get a word file back, preserving all the formatting, layout, etc., as much as we can. Then lastly, translation memory. Um, we talked a lot about it, hopefully everyone knows what it is, but just for those that don't. Uh, so a translation memory is essentially a database that holds previously translated information at the sentence uh, level. So um, source, target, metadata, things like um, is it a heading, is it a table, is it a cell content, etc., and document information. Um, yeah, then some details on the, the content integration API. Um, so as mentioned before, the, the content integration API, um, it leverages um, previous uh, SDL managed translation uh, functionality. Um, so it supports currently SDL TMS and language cloud backends. Um, and with it, it brings all the integrations that we have built up in the last few years. So um, we don't have to rebuild those uh, integrations. Um, in terms of functionality, it provides an easy to use API for uh, project creation. Um, so you can create projects, follow projects, manage those projects. Um, you can easily integrate content repositories. Um, so as mentioned before, we have um, around 100 content integrations, um, but many customers also build their own content integrations if there's a system that's either in-house or very specific that it's not part of our standard portfolio. Um, it also gives you um, summary statistics um, on translation projects, so you can um, discern trends, etc. And it also gives you access to a data feed for reporting purposes. So there's an uh, OData feed um, that you can then um, use in, in third-party reporting engines. 
Um, so in terms of the um, typical process for managing a project like that, so what are the steps um, that happen as part of uh, managing a project using the API? Um, so the first step is authentication. So you authenticate using um, a token. So you get a client ID and a secret or a username and password. Um, you then retrieve a list of project templates. Um, and the list of project templates you receive are dependent on the user access. So um, as a localization department, what you can do is you basically pre-provision these project templates and offer them towards your business units. Um, so you can have marketing-specific project templates versus, say, R&D-specific project templates. So you retrieve that using the API. Um, you then upload your files uh, for translation um, and specify that you want to use this project template. Um, then you send the project creation call as part of that. Um, once the project has been created, you can uh, do a get projects call, which returns you information around what are the projects I have in the system, what's the status, etc. Um, you can also approve and cancel a project uh, programmatically. Um, so if a project status is an approval, you can retrieve that and then programmatically um, approve it. Um, once the translation is done, um, it will reach a for download state uh, where you can then essentially pull, programmatically pull the, the target files back into your content repository. Um, and lastly, you can then also mark a project as complete so that it doesn't show up in your list of ongoing projects anymore. Um, so that's at a very high level, a very simplified process in terms of automating the creation, uh, translation, and delivery of, a, of a, a, a project using a content integration. Um, in terms of the documentation, so this is available today. So if you access this URL, um, you get the API documentation, um, which gives you all the details in terms of what calls you have to do, etc. cetera. Um, there are also some um, getting started guides in terms of uh, what are the steps you have to perform, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of uh, API authentication, so you need uh, user credentials, so username, password. Um, you can then, uh, as part of the application, also define an application. So you can have one or more applications which then give you a client and secret. And using all this information, you can then authenticate. Um, so this allows you to, to have multiple uh, integrations and also be able to discern which one is which and, and what the API access is. OK. Any questions so far on content integration until we go into the future language cloud API? Oh, pretty clear. OK, no questions, good. Um, right, and then, so as mentioned, so we're working on the language called public API, which we're aiming to launch in January this uh, next year. Um, and that is essentially uh, a brand new API that we're building up from the ground up with language cloud concepts in mind. Um, and that gives you access to much more platform functionality. And we will basically, we have a roadmap of priorities in terms of what kind of APIs we want to work through. So, um, and we will work through this. So um, this is also something where this is still at the stage where you as, as customers or prospects can, can influence. So if there are certain things that, um, that you would like to do with the API, um, let us know. And we'll make sure we can shift the priority still. We have a priority that we think makes sense, but we're flexible. Um, so in terms of functionality that we're looking to expose, um, we're focusing right now on, on, on project creation and tracking. Um, but this, compared to the content integration, is at a much more granular level because it gives you access to the backend uh, functionality. So um, using the customer portal and the content integration, you get a simplified representation of the project. So for example, where in the workflow, for example, you might have, um, let's say, 30 workflow steps. Um, the content integration API just gives you a representation in terms of new uh, for approval, uh, in, in progress for download and completed. So that's the level there. But with this new, new backend API, you can basically get a granular level. Is it in linguistic review? Is it in translation? Is it in DTP? So you get the whole. Um, 
flexibility in terms of um, or, or granularity in terms of uh, information. Um, also, tr um, in terms of um, project creation, you have much more options to define how you want to create a project. So using the content integration API, it's very much you need a project template and it has specified information. With this API, you can be a bit more flexible and, and, and decide things at, at runtime when you're creating a project. Um, the next step we're looking at is then project management functionality. So not only creating and tracking projects, but actually um, uh, orchestrating projects. So essentially being able to complete tasks, assign tasks, um, cancel tasks, those kinds of things. So actually doing changes to the project itself. Um, then also configuration management, so uh, crude operations on all the resources, so the giving you the ability to create workflows, create pricing models, project templates programmatically. Um, also automating the creation of translation memories, uh, etc. Um, then we're also looking at translation, so the ability to programmatically access and manage translation memory data actually, so not just the, the creation of the resource, but actually the content of that resource. Um, terminology is another area, so the ability to access and manage uh, terminology, so also creating terminology programmatically, editing terminology. Um, user management, so the ability to automate uh, user creation, group creation, role formation, uh, etc. Um, Extensions, um, so we'll get to that in more detail, is basically the ability to create custom backend and frontend extension. Um, we're looking at the reporting API, so the ability to give you um, access into the reporting data that we're storing um, in an industry standard format so that you can plug it into third party reporting. And so if you have your own in house BI solution where you want to feed data in um, to give you access to that. And then also quite important, the uh, uh, webhooks content. So webhooks are essentially um, are essentially um, API APIs that you can subscribe to. So what that means is, where in the past, for example, you have to call an endpoint and say, "Give me the status back of all the projects." Um, what webhooks allow you to do is basically subscribe to, for example, project created event. Um, and what does, the, what does then does is that language cloud will tell your application a project has been created and you don't need to explicitly go in and ask for it. Um, or things like a project has been, or I don't know, a, a task has been completed, for example. So no longer do you have to poll, but we push actively the information to you. So, uh, so that's less, ex less expensive in terms of API calls that you have to do. Um, yeah, so in terms of service API, so um, as mentioned, we at current date, but it's rapidly changing, we have about 55 microservices. Uh, and so we already have more than uh, 55 low-level service APIs um, that are all used internally and documented. Um, in terms of the API design um, that we're using, we basically have RESTful APIs with JSON payloads, so just standard practice. Um, but in addition to that, we um, are making them flexible so that you can request certain data that you need. So what that means is um, you will be able to send parameters where basically you can say only return specific fields, um, giving you support for filtering and paging so that you can also reduce the amount of data that, um, that you need to, to process. Um, yeah, in terms of resource representation, so pretty much standard. So the ability to read, create, update um, aspects. So this is post, put, get, etc. REST concepts. Um, and also, more importantly, semantic versioning. So the key here is that essentially um, we will version the, the APIs. Um, if we introduce a breaking change, we will release a major uh, public API versioning. Um, but we will keep the previous version um, and then we'll have a deprecation mechanism where we say, okay, after uh, X amount of uh, time, we will deprecate these APIs, pieces update to the newer ones, but we will not um, make breaking changes without giving you the time to, or sufficient time to, to basically update your integrations. 
Um, so that's quite key with, with, with the semantic versioning. And also one of the key reasons why we want to introduce this public API layer on top of the, uh, the internal layer. In terms of security, so um, all API calls um, will honor the access rights that you set up in your account. Um, there's essentially two ways you can build an integration. One is to act on behalf of a real user. Um, so the concept here is basically if you're building an integration where you want to perform actions interactively in the user context. So one example would be, for example, uh, a mobile application. If you build a mobile application and you want to give the ability for a user to perform certain actions in their context, um, the way it would work is basically that when that user logs into your application, it would show them the Auth0 SSO login, um, and the user would have to authenticate with their username and password, and then they can um, perform API calls on behalf of the real user. So what that means is they wouldn't get access to any data that they are not privy to based on permissions in the system. Um, the second use case is if you want to act as a service user. So we'll uh, give you the ability to create service users, um, one or more, that you can then use um, in, uh, in the API calls um, and define certain permissions there. So the use case there is if, you, if you're building some integration where not an individual is really interacting with it, but some kind of automated service. In that case, you would use a, a service user. Um, and in terms of authentication, it's all based on standard or two protocols. Um, so we're not inventing anything new here. Um, webhooks, so as I mentioned, so um, this is essentially REST API callbacks. Um, so this is quite powerful. So I mean, in the example of, for example, a mobile app that would allow you to, for example, have an app which then gives users push notifications, for example, in terms of things that have been changed. So the way it works is basically you have an integrating application um, that actively calls the REST API to perform certain actions. But then you can also subscribe to certain events. So as mentioned, some events that, that we can think of, and again, we can extend this based on feedback and, and requirements, uh, are things like alert me when a project has been created, alert me when a task has been completed, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of use cases where, where you can subscribe to. Um, and this makes it much nicer when you're integrating that no longer you have to poll all the time, but you basically just sit there, wait for the callback, and then you can react essentially. Um, reporting, as I mentioned, so one key thing we want to do is um, while we have embedded uh, an enterprise BI solution into the platform, um, we do know that uh, certain customers, they already have their in-house BI solution that they want to or need to feed with, um, with reporting data. So we want to provide uh, a near real-time data feed, um, which again is based on standards. So there are BI platform status like uh, OData feeds, etc., um, to allow you to consume this API. So if you if you have a Tableau or something like that, um, that you can basically allow uh, to pull content from Language Cloud in, in, into that um, Tableau deployment. So the goal is that you as a customer don't have much need for for custom development. Um, if you're using an industry standard reporting engine. Um, and then this is quite um, something that's quite important and which we're quite keen on is basically um, what we call extensibility. So we talked about the API. So this is very, the API is a very traditional. It's basically I call an endpoint, I get something back. Um, but in terms of extensibility, what we want to do um, is essentially give people the ability to add custom extensions to the platform. Now, in the old world, this is what you m might have called customizations. Um, but because Language Cloud is a, is a cloud platform um, that is shared by everyone, we can't just allow anyone to upload their binar binaries and run their custom code on the platform. Um, so the way it works um, is basically that we will create an extension framework. And this is very similar to, um, so we looked at the way 
Microsoft or Atlassian does it, for example, with their Office add-ins uh, into the Office 365 platform. And we're adopting a similar model where basically Microsoft allows third parties to integrate with their cloud platform. Um, and we're going to, to use the same way. And essentially where we want to get to is very similar as to we have the Studio App Store, um, which is very successful and has, I think, over 300 apps now. Some created by SDL, but many created by third parties and also allowing third parties to, to monetize their add-ons and sell them. Um, we want to get to a same point with Language Cloud. So we want to essentially build a Language Cloud App Store where third parties can uh, integrate their technologies into our platform and, and offer them to, to our customers, essentially. Um, and so the way it works is basically um, there will be uh, a developer portal where basically a developer can develop, build, and submit their applications. So similar, as you know, from Apple App Store, for example. Um, we then have a back office in SDL where basically we review uh, and approve applications. Um, so these are applications. You can build applications that are either public for everyone. So um, if you're a third party and you have a certain extension and you want to offer it to anyone that has a language cloud translation management subscription, you can make it public. But there might also be apps which are just for your organization um, that you have built. So then you can, in terms of scope, just say, OK, this is not public in the App Store. No one else can install it but um, my, my tenant, essentially. Um, but we need to basically uh, approve these applications, review them, and also manage them. So um, if an application mis misbehaves for whatever reason, or we find out that um, there's some kind of uh, um, anything happening that is not according to the rules and the, the contract, we can then basically um, um, delete the applications from, from, from the platform. Um, in terms of the customer and the administration is basically you as a, as a customer that has purchased Language Cloud will essentially be able to browse the App Store for applications um, and then activate or deactivate applications into your tenant. Um, so that you can that you and your users can make use of, of those applications. Um, so in terms of applications that, that we can think of, um, so just some examples. So if we look at the backend, for example, so these would be things like uh, custom workflow tasks. Um, so this would be, as an example, um, have a workflow task that takes a file sends it to some third-party QA check system, performs a QA check, and delivers the file back. Um, or um, one of the early, or the next ones that we're working on, the first one is basically a third-party MT provider. So um, we currently, out of the box, offer an integration with SDL uh, machine translation. Um, but we know that a lot of our customers will use third-party MT providers, like Microsoft and Google, et cetera. Um, so we are offering the ability to integrate and provide your own third-party machine translation provider. So that's actually the first one that we'll be launching and offering. Um, but then also things like custom file filters. So if there is a file format, for example, that SDL doesn't support, it's proprietary, it's a binary format, you can also develop your own file filters and plug them into the platform. Um, QA checks, as I mentioned, so there are some specialized tools that focus on QA checks. Um, you can do that. Other things you can think of is um, invoicing applications. So if you want to programmatically send a quote or an analysis report into a third party system, again, you could automate that using this. Um, in addition to um, backend app extensions, we're also looking at user interface extensions. Um, so this is basically the ability to create your own UI and have it visualized as part of the language cloud platform. Um, so things you can think about is basically creating your own manual task, which, for example, display a certain form where you can ask for certain information, um, integration with, with certain preview types. So if you have a certain um, application where you want to preview content into the platform, new UI actions, new UI tabs, et cetera. So that's uh, things that we want to uh, uh, enable. 
Um, so in terms of concepts that we are thinking about, so basically there's an app. So that's an application that implements certain functionality. Um, extension points, so this is something that we actually need to do, so that's work on our side to basically say what are the extension points that we offer, right? So translation providers, so machine translation providers, we need to actually offer that as an extension point. Um, the ability to create custom workflow tasks, something that we have to enable. So it's, it's part of all of this. Um, we basically have to create these extension points, which then allows people to, to use those integration and extension. Um, any questions on extensibility? Is it clear? Yes? Um, so for the API, we do have a charge. So uh, in, in order to use the public API, there's a, it's a licensing uh, topic. For the extension and the App Store, probably not, because we want to, we want to have a thriving App Store. So I think uh, in terms of you consuming the applications, if, if I don't know, if there's a mich Microsoft MT provider, then you can just use it and plug it in. Then you might have to pay something to Microsoft. But we don't charge you to be able to use apps. Um, in terms of developing your own apps, etc., I don't think we will charge developers to, to build those apps. So we don't do it in studio. We, we are happy if people build these extensions for uh, into into our products. Um, so no, I don't think in terms of extensibility, I don't think there's any charge. I mean, third parties might charge for whatever they offer in terms of functionality. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, you mean in terms of uh, yeah, the payment through SDL and then yeah. Yeah. Um. It's something that is under discussion. We haven't made a decision yet. Um, I mean, so uh, we are looking at, so as part of the whole language cloud platform, we're also looking at things like having a, a marketplace in terms of translation services, et cetera, um, where, where there we, we will take a certain cut of the, of the translation that goes through the platform. In terms of App Store, possibly. Um, I think probably not initially, because we, we wanted to, to build up and we don't want to build any constraints. Um, but we did, I mean, in the studio context, we did have a lot of especially smaller um, integrators that have asked us, can you take care of all the payment processing? Because I'm too small, I don't want to deal with this. So potentially, we might go there, but um, not as a, as a high priority initially. But no. Yes. Yeah. 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 We'll have to. I mean, yeah. It also also all depends on how successful the the app store is, right? The more successful, the uh, the easier it is for us to also invest and make sure that uh, that we support it. But um, yeah, I'm hopeful. If it is even half as successful as the studio app store, I think we're in a good place. So um, it's good. Okay. Um, Any other questions on extensibility? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Good question. I wouldn't know. I don't think it's available in World Server. It might be. I, 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 I would have to ask someone. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, so this is some detail in terms of the extensibility architecture. Um, so yeah, essentially, basically, you as a as an integrator, you would host your own web application, um, and then you would uh, register your application into um, into the platform, and basically send certain requests, integrate with webhooks, um, etc. 
In terms of UI extensions, we would allow you to basically deploy your own UI extensions into Language Cloud, which would then, using the public API, communicate with the backend platform. Um, so these UI extension is mentioned, so this is the ability for you to, for example, add a new tab and display certain content in your tab um, into, into the platform. Um, so this would be developer hosted, not SDL hosted. So you need to have a, a web service available that, that we can talk to. 